right, moving right along, we are on to objective G, which is patterns in evolution. Um, Darwin's theory of natural selection kind of remains the, the central theory of evolution. Um, scientists know now that natural selection isn't the only mechanism, and we have expanded on his ideas since. Um, there's lots of, because of the genetics and our knowledge and our technology with that has allowed us to expand our ideas about how evolution works. These are some images um, that I pulled from the internet that kind of show the classic ideas of what um, evolution revolved around. Now the first picture had a lot of controversy, but it is a very good idea of how man or how hominid species evolved over time. Now the second picture is the evolution of our modern horse. So there are lots of steps along the way and, and believe me when I say this is not it. There are, I don't even remember, I think there's there's some like 25 different um, hominid type scout skulls that have been discovered. Um, from the very first one, which the very first bipedal upright walking hominid, I think, if I remember correct, was Australopithecus, called Lucy. And then we have everything along um, those lines. So we have Homo habilis, um, we have Homo erectus, we have Homo sapien. We have tons of steps along the way. If you actually just do a search on steps of human evolution, um, you'll see that just how many there actually are. And we can do this for most of modern species. We have a general idea of what species they evolved from, but there's some that are still, you know, question mark. Um, this is something that we typically do some math with. The Hardy-Weinberg principle, there's a way to um, analyze populations on a larger scale and do some statistical analysis, but we don't really have time for it. So um, basically looking at what alleles are present in a population and which ones remain relatively constant at genetic equilibrium. But for the Hardy-Weinberg principle to actually work, the population has to meet five different conditions, but most of the time they don't. Um, we haven't talked about genetic drift yet, which we'll get to in another video, um, but there's no gene flow, no mutation, the mating has to be random, and there cannot be any no, there cannot be any natural selection. So very seldom do all of these conditions actually get met within a population. But genetic drift essentially is the change in what alleles are frequent in a population versus ones that aren't. Um, in simple traits, only one of the parents' two alleles are passed on to the offspring, but in large populations, enough alleles drift um, to ensure a relative constant pattern of traits that are passed on from one generation to the next. Um, this example that's here, is it goes along with the idea, um, and you can actually find little games where, where you can plug and play with this stuff. Um, think about these bugs on two different surfaces on sand versus in grass. So this one is actually the, the sand example. So if these bugs were inhabiting sand, which ones are probably going to die out first? They're the ones that don't blend well. They'll be picked off by predators, they'll be smashed by people, and eventually that green coloration will become less frequent in the population because those green individuals are probably not going to survive to reproduce and so the tan coloration will be the primary color. Founder effect and bottlenecking, um, these are kind of connected to each other, but um, founder effect is it's an extreme genetic drift that occurs when the population when a small population settles in an area that is separated from the others, um, and this kind of, that kind of goes into the speciation notes that we're going to do a little bit later, but this can produce unique allelic variation. So if you have a small population that separates, um, there's not as much gene flow, so the number of genes available is smaller, and so sometimes you see um, recessive traits pop out or random... Um, recessive mutations. Um, bottlenecking, this occurs when a population declines so low and then rebounds. So this can 
typically cause inbreeding, which decreases the fertility rate and could contribute to the extinction of a species. And this is actually something that they're trying to deal with with the last uh, surviving cheetahs in the wild. There are so few of them that they're worried about inbreeding and the loss of certain traits. And then um, the we watched a nature video um, earlier in the year where it talked about the blue macaw that because they were pretty much harvested for the pet trade to the point of extinction, all of the ones that they have rescued from the pet trade are as closely related as identical twins. So finding ones that are the most genetically suitable to mate we, it can become a problem. All right. Um, Again, going back to the idea of natural selection, um, there's different types of natural selection, and it really does depend on the situation that you're trying to apply it to. So the first one is called a stabilizing selection. It's the common form of natural selection that operates to eliminate the extreme expressions of a trait when the average expression leads to higher fitness. Now, the example out of the book talks about human baby weights. So Babies that are born with below normal or above normal weights have a lower chance of survival than those that are in the average category. So what's happening is the stabilizing selection is looking to eliminate the above normal and the below normal in favor of the average because the average has higher chances of success. Another type of selection is called disruptive. Uh, basically, this is a process that splits a population into two groups. Um, the best example I could find was looking at water snakes. Now, you would think by looking at each one of these that each one is a different species, but they're actually the same species, but because of regional differences in environment, they have different color patterns. And we can see this for a lot of different species. They'll be related and they'll say like, one species may be the eastern variety, one may be the southern variety, one may be the northern variety, and the only difference is a slight variation in their color schemes, which uh, snakes is a good example, but we can also see this with various species of birds. All right, the last type of selection is sexual selection. So this is a change in the frequency of a trait that is solely based on the ability to attract a mate. Um, this is typically seen in populations where the males and the females differ significantly in, in appearance. So this is really common in birds. Peacocks are the classic example. Um, for peacocks, the bigger, the more beautiful, the brighter the feathers, the better display he can put on for the female, the more likely he is to reproduce in general. However, the bigger and more flashier the feathers, the more likely he is to actually get spotted by a predator and not be able to escape. So it kind of works, it's kind of counterproductive if you think about it. Um, the biggest, most beautiful males, they should be the ones to reproduce, but they're also not going to be able to get away from predators. So, like I said, this is something that we see in birds a lot, or any kind of animal that kind of puts on a beauty display for the female. Um, and that's a, it's a weird sort of animal behavior quirk, but it is interesting to actually sit down and, and, and look at these, but, um, this is going to be the end of the notes for today. And like I said, there's no assignment today. And I know I've been kind of overloading you with assignments. So, um, you get a day off. If you need some extra time to finish up the assignment from yesterday, please take uh, advantage of this time and do that. If you don't have any other questions for me, then, um, We'll end this video, and again, if you need anything, please let me know.